On today's show, it's been a busy off season for a lot of teams and the Padres by usual standards, not as much, but there's still a lot to talk about. We will be grading myself and a special guest, Mr. Nick Lee, all the off season moves the Padres have made thus far, because that's what we do out here. So let's get to it. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Padres podcast. I am, oh, oh, hold on, what is today? It'll be January 12th. That's right, January 12th, Friday. Hopefully you all are having a very fun Friday. I am, as always, your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly, certainly, certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres if you only want Padres content. Go check out the YouTube as well if you want to see my my donkey hat that I'm wearing uh, and say hi to Pac-Man Tatis. That's always something you can do. Um, feel free to do that. Also, go check out Just Baseball, where I am a frequent contributor, and I've got some cool projects coming up there as well. But I'm only one of the hosts today. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a real fun Friday, ladies and gentlemen. I'm being joined by a frequenter, uh, uh, someone you might have seen in the land of Padres land, especially Padres Twitter, is Mr. Nick Lee, who's a contributor for Locked On Seahawks, the East Village Times, great website for Padres fan community talk and articles, as well as Vanquish the Foe, SB Nation's BYU blog. That's a lot. You're doing a lot, man. So what's going on, Nick? Oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, my, my hometown Padres, my alma mater, and where I'm currently living in Washington. So there's my quick I explanation of why I'm so eclectic with my sports. But you know, I, I did like that. a certain I did like a certain football team in San Diego before they moved up north. So <laughs> moving up here is a bit it was a bit easy to uh, go into the warm bosom of the Seahawks. <laughs> um, they're, oh they're man, at the peak oh, of their uh, their run. So yeah, I mean, you made the right choice. I get it. I mean, I am still <laughs> a fan of that team, much to the chagrin of many of my listeners. Uh, I don't, I can't defend it. Um, and honestly, they're probably right. It's it's miserable out here. Football's mean. Um, but sir, I'm super excited today. We're going to be grading all of the offseason moves that the Padres have made thus far. Even though on the surface, I think a lot of people don't think they've done much. I think they've actually had a very interesting offseason. We're going to break that down. Give it a little report card letter grade from both of us. Today's episode, guys, is brought to you, though, by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase go check that out Whew, man nick first of all before we get into the individual sort of uh moves that the padres made at least the biggest ones we're not necessarily going to go through you know uh, arbitration cases we're not going to go through some player to be named later thing not that they made anything like that but we're not going to go to the minor you know granular ones but nick heading into the off season, what were some of your expectations about the overall moves that they would make well, um, you know, certainly to expect the level, the maximum level of uh, excitement of the previous few off seasons, I think mm-hmm. was a bit unrealistic. I didn't necessarily expect something like this. I did. I did consider the Soto trade a possibility. Um, mm-hmm. And I was kind of hoping for a more like, uh, you know, I, I you know we were all hoping for a bigger return, obviously, but for mm-hmm. for him, but you know we, it was just wasn't realistic. But you now I, I definitely wanted them to to try to be aggressive because of the free agent losses that they were going to shoulder. I was hoping that they would kind of counteract that with um, equal aggression, um, mm-hmm. but they've certainly take taken a different route. Um, I, I hesitate to use the term "cry poor," <laughs> but it's <laughs> kind of in that realm. And it's been a little underwhelming and I'm a little bit down on it, um, you know, but obviously it's not over. We're, we're mid January, but um, yeah, I, I was, I was hoping and maybe not, I don't know if expecting that is the right word, but certainly hoping that they would counteract the giant losses in free agency with uh, additions of their own. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And just yesterday on my podcast, obviously this podcast, uh, I talked about the most sad things that happened for the Padres in Padre land this year. And let me tell you, uh, it's recently it has been the Dodgers upgrading at nearly every single level, and it's been really miserable. We're not going to get all on that, though. We're going to talk specifics, and we might as well talk start with that soda trade. So 
this was the big bombshell. Um, obviously, I would argue next to Otani, probably the biggest move that's happened this offseason, um, at least on the surface level. And it was nuts. I remember when it happened. It was being rumored for a while. We had all the back and forth. We had, you know, if you're on Twitter a lot, Yankees fans being like, what did Michael King is amazing. It's like, I, I, I he, he's interesting. But like, what, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? Um, and it was a big deal, obviously. So. And also, by the time this podcast came comes out, uh, Juan Soto actually avoided arbitration with the Yankees for, I believe, the record thirty one million, uh, which is pretty wild. Uh, it just goes to show you how good Juan Soto is as a player. The Padres received in exchange for Juan Soto, Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez, Michael King, Andrew Thorpe, all pitchers. Um, oh, and Kyle Higashioka as well. My apologies. Um, Nick, let's get into it, man. Um, what did you think of the trade? Kind of felt like Thanos, you know, like a little inevitable. I am inevitable, you know. And yeah. There's that the existential dread uh-huh. as those reports came out of. Okay, this is. It's not a matter of if now. I think it's when. And just the fact that it's the Yankees, I think, makes yeah. it a bit. I mean, the Dodgers would have been obviously the the worst one, but the Yankees, I think, would be second, maybe, or the Giants, perhaps. But, um, it hurts. I mean, there's no way. Um, my heart was sad. My brain understood. You know. Um, mm, yeah. I mean, how do you trade away a generational talent and not and leave in that whole trade not one but two gaping holes in your in your outfield and feel good about it? You know, like I, I get they they got a lot of pitching depth which was sorely needed, and I know I just got on a soapbox about addressing the you know the losses in free agency and they kind of mm. did in that trade a little bit. Um, but when you look at the the return, you know, I, I struggle to to be super on the Michael King hype train quite yet. Just mm-hmm. because, you know, sure, he's got the two two three ERA from nine starts at the late last year. His baseball mm-hmm. savant page is pretty red, as we like. Uh, great changeup. But my biggest question mark, he's only exceeded seven innings once in the, in the big leagues, hundred no more than 104. And can he shoulder, you know, a, a workload of a major league starting rotation pitcher through a whole season? And if that's your centerpiece, um, you know, that there's certainly some question marks. Now he could turn into your great number three. And if he if he's your a viable number three option this year, great. I think that's a success. But just the overall feeling of it of the trade, just to kind of give a broad view, was obviously disappointment. So mm-hmm. looking at Soto and Brown and Gold, especially with the guys around oh, him, man. was so awesome. Like I, I would I I cried when they got when the, when that trade happened. Like when the, to get oh my God, Soto, yeah. I was on a work uh, trip. <laughs> I just I just took my rental car and drove for hours listening to the you know, talk radio and podcasts. I couldn't get enough. I was so happy. It was awesome. It was you know, great. Padres fans were just yeah. starved for anything positive, and that was like a true, mm-hmm. you know, like we have arrived. This is a, we are a team to be reckoned with. And you know, they ran to the L- NLCS that year, but this was yeah the the existential dread was not was not fun for this trade. Um, I, I did want a bit of a, a better return. Um, but I think that was maybe a bit unrealistic. I do like the pitching depth and certainly a guy like Drew Thorpe could come turn out to be mm-hmm. a really nice piece later on. But of course, it, it can't not hurt to let go of Soto. Lot to unpack there. First of all, that was a bar. The it hurt my heart, but my brain understood. That was great. I really appreciate that. I'm definitely I might use that in the future. <laughs> um also should mention, I forgot to mention, and I don't know why I always forget this, probably because Soda's such a big presence, also sent in the trade is Trent Grisham um, to the Yankees as well. And I think part of why I forgot is because Trent Grisham has been uh, pr- pretty um, anemic when it comes to offense and just constantly looking like a guy that I still think could be an interesting player elsewhere, but it doesn't look like it was going to happen here. That part, I think, is more of a benefit for the Yankees versus a loss for the Padres. Um, I agree with what you said. I struggle with this one. And we're going to give our, our, our grades in just one second. But for me, I think it's one of two things. If you look at it from the out of context, this is an F uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I think that or D at, at the best, because when you just look at big superstar trades, you know, everyone always, oh, well, they got a lot of prospects. If anyone can name me one time that a star level player was traded for prospects and they got value or at least one guy who was even half as good it basically never happens you can look at Mookie Betts you can look at Nolan Arenado you can look at Paul Goldschmidt uh, just for recent examples and feel free go ahead and look them up uh, in terms of superstar players of this caliber who are under control um, not necessarily trade deadline rentals those ones are weird like your Chris Archers for some reason are the ones that everybody gets the biggest return on 
So if you look at it from that perspective, it is, it is an F. I think it's an F that they got here in the first place. How you are in a, in a place where you need to trade this guy because you need to shed payroll. It's like, well, why did you sign Bogarts? Why did you do Manny Machado extension? Jake Cronenworth, you Darvish, Robert Suarez. Why'd you do them all at once is the other thing. And I think that's the key thing here. If they didn't do them all at once, maybe they don't have to make this move. And frankly, if they just played better, maybe they don't have to make this move. Um, but in context, I think I'm going to give this one a B minus, Nick. Um, I really like Drew Thorpe. I think that this guy is a dude who strikes out, a lot, gets a lot of strikeouts. And I think he could be one of those like, oh my God, Drew Thorpe. And he's much higher on everyone's top 100 list as time goes on. Johnny Brito and Randy Vasquez, those are innings eaters as far as I'm concerned. Maybe Niebla can cook and turn one of them into something a little bit more interesting, long inning arms. I'm totally for that. But more importantly, I don't want to be stuck in these situations where you have to have your Rich Hills, your Jake Arrietas, your Vincent Velasquez. And I think that those guys are better than that. And I know that doesn't sound like if you're, it's like bars down here, but that stuff adds up for the course of a season. I'm not talking playoff starts. Obviously, I don't watch Johnny Brito and Randy Vasquez as the four and five, but it adds up those one win players, those 0.8 players that fill in if injuries happen, I do think matter. And the last piece is Michael King, who I do think was being a little bit overstated by uh, fans of New York and the New York media a little bit, but he's still really interesting. And we've had guys with the Padres recently that we've been like, okay, they looked good last year, but can they keep it up? You know, Seth Lugo and Michael Waka, especially Waka being a good example. Lugo is a reliever turned starting pitcher, and he did great here last year, uh, especially for his role. And like you mentioned, he's flashed some signs since 2022. 2.6 ERA, 30.6 strikeout rate across 155 innings. That's not too bad. So he slots in potentially as your number three. I still think it's just hard to stomach that you're giving up Juan Soto, a perennial MVP candidate, and especially one that's young. He's like 25. He's younger than me. He's younger than both of us. Like that's that's what we're dealing with here. So for me, I'm going to give it a B minus because I think that the context matters. But if you were to choose out of context and say, you know what, it's you need to take those other factors when judging this trade and grading it and saying, I don't care if it's it's um, the context matters. I'm doing it in a vacuum. This is a D minus. I totally would get that, too. I, I what you said before you know, early on was I could totally see this package turning into I'll give him a free plug uh, like a jolly olive. Where are these prospects now? <laughs> like, what happened to the guys in the Juan Soto yeah. trade? You know, yeah. like, the, Where the are they now? <laughs> I, I could totally see that happening. Um, but what's funny is uh, I actually, Javier, we did not, you know, we did not co-conspire before. I also gave this trade a B minus. Wow. Um, How about that? Just, yeah. It's just the, the Michael King intrigue for sure. I do think I, when I, I was getting pretty grumpy when this trade happened and I started calling him Nick Martinez 2.0, um, cause that's kind of where he's been like just the role. Um, certainly he could turn out to be a viable starter. I don't want to, you know, put a stamp on his career or anything like that yet. Drew Thorpe, I think, I think we both agree. Um, if, if someone, you know, two, three, four years from now says, Hey, Drew Thorpe turned out to be the best part of that deal. I would not be shocked yeah. with one bit. He he could contribute later this year. Um, if mm -hmm. things break right um, in that rotation, you, you like the lefty, the, he's already the number six prospect in a deep farm for the Padres, you know, mid nineties fastball, great change up. Mm -hmm. I expect him to push for a call up later this year, but yeah. So Michael King and Drew Thorpe obviously are the two bigger ones. Higashioka, you know, kind of throw in back catcher, catcher. Why not? maybe yeah, once sure. or twice a week spells campy. Hopefully we all expect campy to you know, lose Camposano to take the extra step. But yeah, B minus for me, obviously it really hurts to let go of a Juan Soto type talent. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with how did we get here? The, I mean, it's your own fault. Yeah. You made your own bed. Now it mm. sucks that this is absolutely, this is, it sucks that it's necessary is kind of how I felt at the end. Yeah. And it's not like it's a different GM taking over or something like that, who was like, Oh God, I inherited this. How do I salvage it? It's still AJ Preller. So that's a whole uh, can of words to unbag. Uh, and there's plenty of other cans to unclip. What's the phrase? Un Crack open. Can <laughs> cans to crack open, I guess something like that. But before we get into the rest of the moves, including some managerial moves, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get into that, I want to take a quick second to talk about our friends over at Game Time. Look, purchasing tickets, it can be frustrating, especially when it's a little bit last second. But with Game Time, oh, doctor, it is not. 
It is not, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it's great. And it's not just for games. Let me make that note. It's not just for games. You want concert tickets. Maybe you want to see, I don't I don't follow music, not going to lie. If Beyonce or Taylor Swift are still on tour, you can go, go check that out. You go check out NFL playoff games. Those are happening right now. Maybe you want to be crazy and go for something next week. If you're going to assume that the, I don't know, the Bills are going to win or whatever, then go ahead and check that out. They've got you covered with last minute ticket deals, flash zone deals, different zone deals on the, across the stadium. Very easy to find the tickets. They're always there for you. And if you're a visual learner like myself, they give you seat views. So you click on it and they show you like, what exactly does this look like? Instead of just that overhead sort of map. So they've got you there. Lowest price is guaranteed, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and many more. So take it out. Check it out, guys. Uh, download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem that code. It's very simple. Locked on MLB, actually. I almost messed up there. Locked on MLB for $20 off, not just locked on. Game time, last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. And ladies and gentlemen, just like that, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. Ran a tiny bit long in that first segment, but how can we not? It's Juan Soto. And uh, look, just one last cu- couple thought. We agreed on that one. I also think you can't underestimate. You mentioned up the farm, growing farm system. It does mean something that's like, hey, if you like your team and you want to trade a Robbie Snelling or Dylan Lesko, at least you got Drew Thorpe hanging out back there. You got a little bit more of a, a protection and you don't have to force those guys up either uh, if you were desperate. So that's really cool. Um Let's talk about Mike Schilt, uh, new Padres manager. How the Bob Melvin losing Bob Melvin feels like it was months ago. Um, not months ago, years ago, I should say, because it actually was months ago. Uh, it's really wild that this is the dude who took the Padres the farthest that they had basically ever been, at least since I've been alive, frankly, um, aside from, no, yeah, since 96, I'm pretty sure this is the farthest uh, into the NLCS that. You lose that manager who also, by the way, in the A.J. Preller era, had the most wins in a single season of any manager in the A.J. Preller era. And then after a disappointing year, they lose Bob Melvin to the rival Giants, which I still can't get over. And then you hired Mike Schilt, um, formerly of the St. Louis Cardinals, did win a manager of the year award as well. He was kind of involved with the Padres um, after he was fired. He was brought over. Um, Man, I don't even know where to start on this one. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, but it is it's hard. This isn't as like empirical and easy to just look at data points with players because managers are a little bit hard to gauge when it comes to baseball. But what were your kind of initial thoughts? You give your letter grade to your reaction, whatever, on Mike Schilt being the next Padres manager. Well, first, I'll move to the or I'll, I'll start with the Bob Melvin piece. I love Bob Melvin. Um, mm-hmm. when, when he got hired, I was I was over the moon and to immediately my first reaction when he went from leading the Padres to an NLCS and then yeah, that kind of a trip up in 2023, obviously. And then going to the giants, my immediate thought was Bruce Bochy 2.0. Here we go. There's, mm-hmm. I mean, let's be real. There's no way it does not work with Bob Melvin and the giants that is going <laughs> to work and it's going to be painful <laughs> for the Padres. Um, so that aside, if they had to hire somebody new because of that this year, Mike Schilt, I think, is a pretty darn good, darn good choice. Um, I like the you know previous managerial experience with a pretty veteran team. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there's some veteran pieces that are you know uh, have their own egos. I think Shield is a good good manager in that sense. You mentioned uh, manager of the year. He's worked in the farm system, which I think is really valuable. My biggest critique. I've been very vocal about this on Twitter and anyone who listen to me. Um, my biggest critique of the Preller era is the straight up pretty much refusal to develop their solid minor leaguers that they've had and go from that to contributing viable big leaguers on in a Padres uniform and going, just having that streamline that pipeline from a great farm system to turning into great big leaguers on your team and developing and putting them at effort. Also after they make the big leagues and your other big leaguers developing them that way while they're on their big league roster, I think is their is Preller's biggest demerit in my eyes. Mm-hmm. And ha- hiring Schilt, I think, is a great step in the right direction. You hire a guy who's familiar with your system, who's who's you know seen face to face your prospects, kind of hoping mm-hmm. that uh, or kind of yeah, you know, great point, guiding him that way. So I, I like that. I'm you know, it's not quite a fresh voice because he's been with the team for a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Preller's fifth full time manager hire. I'm not super high high on that. <laughs> it's <crazy>. um, <laughs> but just kind of to close on on my thoughts. You know, kind of do. I apologize for the Seahawks crossover since I do locked on Seahawks, but 
he's got a little bit of Pete Carroll in him. Mm. Um, just reading, especially that San Diego Union Tribune article that came out. I just eaten that up before we came on. Um, that it just seems like relationships matter, people matter yeah. to him. And Let's I go love watch that piece play, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I I think that that is a huge, not that Bob Melvin wasn't, but I think yeah. mm-hmm. Mike Schilt is, is a great step in that direction. And just that thing that stood out to me was that four bullet point thing where it's um, he had a T-shirt made when he first became a coach. It was together. Defense makes routine plays. Pitchers throw strikes. Offense executes. And he wants to make that the Padre way. Look at that. Well, if those yeah. th- things become the yeah. Padre way, that'll be the first time in 54 years <laughs> that that becomes the Padres way. This is an A for me. If they had to make a hire, if they had to replace mm-hmm. Bob Melvin, this is an A. I think this is a, a, a good of a start to a new manager managerial era as you can get. Whew. I'm going to put my tin full hat on one more time. <laughs> Here, Here we go. go. I like it. There you go. It's on. Um, my only thing with this, and it, this is just me reading way too deep into stuff, as one does. When he was originally fired, the St. Louis Cardinals aren't a dumb organization. If this was the Colorado Rockies, I'd be like, wow, yeah, you guys just are doing what you usually do. I'm not saying that there was anything nefarious. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that's not a team that usually makes dumb decisions. Could they be, um, to use another football analogy, doing a New York Giants thing, which is a team that historically is well run. And then circa 2016, they said, actually, we don't like doing that anymore. Trading Odell Beckham, hiring dumb coaches, all that stuff, you know, football people know Um, that could be happening here with the Cardinals. They were really bad last year. They reportedly were like one of the other teams with Juan Soto, but they didn't want to give up like Dylan Carlson, which is wild to me, uh, who now has like zero value. So maybe they are entering that phase where they're not very good anymore for a bunch of reasons. That's totally possible. But it's just a note to be like, oh, maybe they knew this guy isn't that great. It's possible. Um, I think that there's some other interesting names that were out there you could bring up um, for sure. But I'm OK with it, man, because my other thing is. I just don't know. This is uh, it's so hard to gauge what if who is a problem with the Padres locker room. And I mean that, like, I don't know if they necessarily have this giant issue. I don't know if secretly Manny Machado hates Xander Bogarts. I don't know. There's just so many conflicting reports, vibes that I I think clearly something's wrong, but I can't tell if it's just what always happens, which is, guess what? It's not fun to hang out with each other for 162 games when you stink. You know what I mean? And you're disappointing. Or if it's like, no, there's some genuine distaste there. So if there's some genuine distaste there and it wasn't, from a Juan Soto or Naiman Soto, just a former player that has left, then it might not even matter who the manager is. It might just be like these guys like might hate each other. Now, frankly, baseball, we've seen guys succeed. Everyone go check out Secret Bases Beef History on uh, Jeff Kett and Barry Bonds. You know what I mean? It's it's not the one that matters the most compared to other sports, but it's just worth pointing out. I'm going to give this one a B plus. Um, I like the hiring. It's not the most thrilling, young guy, interesting, new guy who comes up and is like, I got a bunch of different ideas, but in baseball, you don't necessarily need that. So, you know, what? I, I changed my mind. I'm going to give it a minus because I just think that my bit, my last point, you didn't do what Preller usually does, which is someone I knew from Texas or someone who will just be a puppet for me. No offense to your Jace Tinglers and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But that's just the vibe I get that you're an extension of the front office. And that's why Melvin was so exciting. Cause I'm like, Oh, you just hired a guy who's great. So I'm happy that they didn't do Ryan Flaherty. Not trying to be mean to Ryan Flaherty, but hitting coach, hitting wasn't that great last year. So I don't want to do something where you were friends with Manny Machado and now you're the manager. We don't need a so, yes man. We yeah, don't need a yes exactly. Man. We don't need a yes no. man. And it's like, you don't you don't have to placate Manny Machado. Like you, you gave him a huge contract. You know what I mean? So it's fine. He can re- remain on staff. That's one thing. But as a manager, I wasn't for that. Um, So I'm just glad that it wasn't that. I'm glad that it wasn't. I believe Phil Nevin was another candidate who I didn't hate. Or anything, but that just feels a little bit like, well, what did he do? He didn't quite succeed. Could you blame the GM for the Angels? Sure. But it's not like there was a lot of success there. At least with this, like you mentioned, knows the players in the system. And the last time he was a manager, very successful. So I'll give it an A-. minus. Absolutely. Uh, we're doing good, man. But we're going to ramp it up just a tiny bit. Um, next big move uh, I want to talk about is Yuki Matsui. Um, who the Padres acquired for. I don't have it up right now because I am a fool. Um, let me see. Yuki Matsui, where's the spot track? The spot track ever freeze for you? Because it does a for me. Like, I, ha- I have it yeah. as five years for 28 million. Okay, 
Yes, five years, twenty eight million. Because I wanted to make sure. So him and it's like okay. I went to fan graphs, but but gotcha, uh, gotcha. Numbers are a little weird, but yeah. Um, seems cool to me. And we're gonna get into the other guy that happens here, Scott Barlow. One of the things I like about this deal was that they made some room, they made some salary, and said we do need to address our bullpen. I don't think the bullpen was fluky. I am one of those people who think that the offense was actually really fluky last year. I don't think that that is something that translates. You don't go 0 and 16,000, frankly, uh, with uh, in one run games. You don't go 0 and 13, and to the point where I am actively rooting for you to lose because I think it'd be funny if you broke the record. <laughs> like that's where I was at, especially when they were eliminated. I thought it would have been hilarious. I would have been like, not the only one. Trust me. <laughs> I remember when they almost lost, and that game also would have eliminated from, from the playoffs. I was almost I was annoyed. Like, you could that. make double history on the same day. <laughs> I thought that would have been amazing. But um, Yuki Matsui, um, I think it helped this Padres bullpen. I do not think the Padres bullpen was a fluke at all. I think that Hater, considering how disappointing the bullpen was and you had the best closer in the sport last year, I just think that's really glaring. And I think that they've done a lot of moves this offseason. And Matsui, he could be the new closer. I'm a little bit worried about what this could spell for how they feel about Robert Suarez. But overall, I like it. All of his numbers seem really good out of Japan, he's been a star there. He's not an overpowering guy who blows fastballs by you. This is not Araldis Chapman. This is not Trevor Rosenthal, who we had that one year. Not one of those guys, but he just he toys with you. He's got a nice arsenal and the numbers, the numbers track. And I don't think that they're gonna throw him in the closer role immediately. Uh, I think that that'd be foolish. But even if he's just a seventh or eighth inning guy, fine. I like that they invest in a bullpen. I'm gonna give this move move a B plus. So so far, we, we've been like really the same exact. We've been like the same thing with all our grades so far. I'm giving this a B plus. I like Matsui and I just like what it stands for, which is them saying we need to address the bullpen. And lately the Padres have been good at that. So what do you think? Yeah, I actually gave it a B as well. Um, so not necessarily anything negative on why I gave it a B instead of a B plus. Um, maybe it's just because he's kind of on an unknown coming from, you know, mm-hmm. trans, trans, uh, trans specific, I should say. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, one five seven ERA last year, ninety five saves the last three years. Obviously, different league, um, but those those numbers don't lie. Um, that splitter, I love the the lefty side. That splitter seems yeah. to play really well. Um, I, I wrote quick plugola. I did write an article on East Village Times about perhaps the Padres might do a little bit of closer by committee, um, where Suarez kind of steps in and maybe Matsui in a certain lefty situation or even Wusak Go. Um, mm-hmm. who's got closing experience too. Maybe they're, or, or they have a straight up competition in spring training, who knows. Um, but I, I like the, cause I think we all can agree of, of all the aspects of baseball, the bullpen is probably the most volatile and mm-hmm. unpredictable part of the team where you can have, you can all of a sudden have this eclectic group of misfits turn in a top five bullpen <laughs> um, or you can completely crater um, with some solid guys. Like, yeah, would they, uh, you know, they, they had Josh Hader and, you know, some other guys kind of underachieved. So uh, I'll give it a B. I like Matsui. I like the left side. I like the repertoire he brings. Just the five-year deal for an unknown might is reason why I keep it from being an A. But um, I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about him in, in you know maybe a seventh inning role or you know situational lefty kind of guy. Absolutely, I'm excited about it. I can't wait. And frankly, it's just exciting. Uh, it's exciting to have these two players that are joining the bullpen. Actually, there's three new bullpen guys that. Uh, we'll be talking about this is only just one before we get into the rest of those. And we kind of close out this very fun, just just the most tame off season by Preller uh, relativity uh, when it comes to stuff. Before we do that, guys, I want to talk to you about our good friends from you know where. You know what I'm going to say. Everybody knows what I'm going to say. I'm talking about FanDuel, man. We love FanDuel over here at Lockdown Padres and the Lockdown Network. NFL regular season. It's donezo. Finished. You're probably getting ready for your football parties on Saturday and Sunday. Well, we got you. If you want to make your bets over at FanDuel right now, new customers get 150 buckaroos and bonus bets. Guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's 150 bucks, man. In bonus bets, win or lose. It's a great deal. FanDuel's got you covered. Really easy to use app. They've got everything. They've got this explore tab. They've got live same game parlays. You can bet the over unders. You can bet the spread. You can do whatever you want. If you think um, if you think the the Chiefs are going to lose, which I frankly do, you can do that. You can absolutely do that. Um, if you want to just 
be you want to zig when everyone else is zagging you could bet on the eagles who have had like a 2021 padres level collapse they got you over there at FanDuel, or if you just want to bet individual players um so go check that out guys fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a walk in layup touchdown whatever you want to call it uh yeah walk in touchdown that's a real thing uh FanDuel official partner of the nfl and ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Final waning moments of the Lockdown Padres podcast. Fun Friday, grading the Padres off season. So far, Nick and I have been pretty much on the same wavelength when it comes to these moves. Soto trade, both of us giving a B minus. Nick giving Schilt an A, me an A minus. And then Yuki Matsui, me a B a plus. And did you give that a B plus too? I forgot. Okay, it was solid B. B. Solid B, solid B. So there we go. Let's talk about, let, let's quickly run through this. Woosak go. This is the recent one that happened, and I actually did an episode on this fairly recently. So if you guys want my full thoughts on that, but bottom line, I'm giving this one an A. And the reason I'm giving this an A is because, first of all, I just love what this represents. I love that Preller is bargain bin hunting. I know that sounds crazy. I hate when teams do that. They kick the can down the road. But the Padres are this weird team where they are spending a lot of money. They just have to be a little bit smarter about it. They're saying, you know what? Let's test out these young kids. Let's take out. Let's test out Jacob Marcy. Let's see what we get out of Jackson Merrill and not just trade him for Shane Bieber, right? Or whoever it is. And I really like that. And for me, Wusak Go is a little bit scary in the sense that he's lost a lot of his control. Uh, the control doesn't seem to be there. I think it was only like like five other pitchers that had more walks per nine than him um, this past season out from the KBO. He was a lot more exciting in previous years, but for me, two years, 4.5, that's nothing. And if he is just able to be a solid average reliever, that's a, that's a bargain. All he has to be is an average major league baseball player at that price. And if he's able to attain what he had before, this is a guy that gets ground balls and a lot of strikeouts. And we've got Ruben Niebel as the pitching coach. I am all for letting that man cook. So just figure out the control stuff. This could be like the what the heck move um, of, of the Padres. Everyone's like, how did this happen? Or he's not good. And then we're like, ah, whatever. But it's only 4.5 million. So that's why I'm giving it a day. Yeah, I mean, you're right. That that contract, that's pretty much a, a side of guaca salsa, burros and fries or something. It, it's <laughs> it's cheap. Um, I, I am a little leery of his ERA more than doubling between 2022 and 2023. Absolutely. With Absolutely. a full walk and a half more per nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am a little leery of that. I think I understand maybe there were some injury things going on too. Um, and yeah, you mentioned the ground ball. 65.8 ground ball rates yeah. would have yeah. been, I think, top 10 in, in the MLB, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I'm going to give this a B minus. Um, not because of the contract. I think the contract is great. Um, just again, even more of an unknown in a, in a less of a bit, less... Um, of a comparable league than uh, Yuki Matsui was in. Um, but yeah, you're right. If, if he just becomes an average, you know, your, your run of the mill sixth inning, maybe seventh inning reliever. Sure. Sign me up. So, and of course with that name, either a, the jokes write themselves if things don't go well and B <laughs> yeah. um, if they do go well, that's an immaculate chant. So yeah. Um, B minus, but uh, but it certainly could turn out great, especially from you know a bargain standpoint. I do like they're kind of going the Asian route with with some of the Asian <laughs> have flavor, um with that because I, I think that's a great way to bargain hunt because they don't have that, yeah. that retread uh, of guys in the big leagues. They're unproven, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit more of a chip on their shoulder. Who knows? And yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Let me able to cook. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Hey, it worked out with Hassan Kim pretty well. So uh, very happy about that. Um, Really exciting stuff. I can't wait to see how this guy is. And again, if it's a disaster, go ahead and make fun of me. But for now, I am really bullish on this this move. I just think the upside's there. Next one. This one happened a while ago. And it happened, and I swear, I it just wasn't a big deal. It feels like when it happened. I don't know how to explain that. But Scott Barlow being traded to the Cleveland Guardians for Eniel de los Santos. First of all, immaculate name for my guy. Eniel de los Santos. I know everyone listening, say it to yourself right now. Let them say it. They said it to themselves. It sounds amazing. It's great. Scott Barlow. I talked with Jeff. Um, Jeff Ellis of Lockdown Guardians. I think the best way to say this is Barlow's upside is is higher. Santos's floor is higher. Um, I think that that's what the Padres did here, and he costs a lot less. And they said we have to save money, so that's what we're doing. If you look at his last two seasons, one point nine F four from Barlow, one point seven F four from Eniel Santos, three point one eight ERA from Santos. 
from Scott Barlow. Again, last two seasons because he had a, a really bad last season. So if we were to look at before that, Barlow was like a, a top seven or so reliever. So the upside is there. It's it's a little nerve wracking because I do worry that like this guy just had that weird, let's say Josh Hader season. Um, Josh Hader in 2022 was randomly bad, <laughs> like, like really randomly bad. No one knew what happens. If that's what happened to Scott Baller, where he was just randomly bad and he gets right back on track with a team that is known for procuring pitching and fixing pitching, um, that's where we got Ruben Niebla from. Then this might be one that we're like, oh God, <laughs> we really, we were really that cheap that we gave up someone who was an all star closer. So for that reason, because I am scared of the Barlow upside, this one's a B minus for me. Um, but I do like Santos. I do think that you did get someone good. And again, well, yes, you were saving on money. It's not like they pocketed that. They did spend it on Go and Matsui at the very minimum. So I'm going to give it a B minus. We're on the same wavelength there, actually, because I'm mm-hmm. giving this a B plus because of what you mentioned at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I read the the arbitration mark for Barlow ended up being about six point seven million mm-hmm. uh, for the Guardians, and um, you know he was pretty darn good. But you kind of got Wusa Go and Yuki Matsui for almost that same price. Yeah. So. You got two, hopefully average, maybe slightly above average relievers um, for the price of Barlow. So I'm going to give it a B plus. And you know, Enel De Los Santos last two years, three one eight ERA, one twenty six ERA plus the last two seasons. So you know, old friend alert. It's kind of been a season of old friend alert too. And you know, yeah. he, was, he was the number seventeen prospect, I think, of the Padres. And then they yeah. then they traded him for another old friend, Freddie Galvis. Yeah, and it's yeah. all come full circle from Freddie Galvis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I love that. Yeah, so you you get Anil De Los Santos, and then you add Wusak Go and Yuki Matsui with perhaps some savings from that deal to, to Barlow. So B plus for me. I think this is one of their more heady moves of the offseason. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's you know are they going a little bit too galaxy brain with it? Is my concern, but again, um, I still like Santos. I think that he can do stuff and you know, reunion here. So I like that a lot. Um, and I believe, do we have, we just have basically two more moves, two more moves. Uh, they're both, in my opinion, the memes of all of the ones that we've discussed so far. That is number one, Matt Carpenter being traded to the Braves and uh, as, as, as along with Ray Kerr and 1.5 million um, for outfielder Drew Campbell. Um, not much to say on this one. Drew Campbell is a middling prospect. Could he do something? Sure. But you're really just this is a salary dump and it's just trying to get away from Matt Carpenter. My gosh, <laughs> what a that that contract was a human atrocity. Yeah, it was it was pretty it, rough. We're lucky it that bad. it was just a two year thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to cripple you. But that was very chasing the trend uh, for a lack of a better term. You know, like just being Yankee like, Stadium wow, merchant. the Yankee Stadium merchant. <laughs> that's what I had um, been scared of. I was, and then Nelson Cruz too. Like, hopefully the Padres don't get, you know, washed up guys that are a little bit more name value than actual value. And unfortunately, that seems to be more the case in baseball. You can argue not as much in football and basketball that like it actually means something if players have been somewhere. But if you're done, you might be done. And look, uh, you moved on from there. I'm still curious to see um, if the Padres try and add some sort of DH type. Teoscar Hernandez just got signed. JD Martinez is still out there. I'm the weird idiot who think Jesse Winker could be interesting in a platoon role. I know, I know, but my friends in Seattle wouldn't let's, let's, agree. But yeah, yes. I know, I know he's really bad. I know, I know, but like, I'm just, I'm curious. I think he would cost nothing. Um, so I'm curious to see what they do with that DH spot, um, if they do anything, or if they're just going to bring up some minor league player, whatever. I'm very curious to see what they do there. This one's like a C, only because I don't know what else to give it. I, I, I might give it like an NA. Not applicable. I actually you know, gave like, it an A. Because, I gave it an A because we got Matt Carpenter out of town. It was <laughs> savings, so I actually gave it an A. And you got um, something, right? You got like something. you, you got a thing. And it, even you if Drew it. Campbell isn't all that great, at least you got a thing. So you know what? I think you might be right on this one. Yeah, a lotto ticket, perhaps. Yeah, a lotto ticket. Yeah, you know what? That's worth it for a contract that you should never should have given out. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, last move. <laughs> I'm just gonna come right out of the gate. This was an A plus. This is an A plus. Luis Patino, yes. my guy, um, famously traded to the Rays as part of a big package uh, for Blake Snell. Pretty much the centerpiece of that. Pretty trade. much the centerpiece, yeah. Especially at that time, which is a wild, wild thing to say. I'm gonna pull up the full trade details uh, right now. But um, a Preller fleece, if I've ever had one. 
probably has made a lot of mistakes. Frankly, I think his biggest mistake is the behind the scenes stuff that everything gets, keeps getting reported with the micromanaging, all the managers. But he's had some good trades, man. Yeah, I know. Hosmer. Uh, okay, I know, I know. The Jay Cronenworth one. Yes, I know. But man, I will take a guy who swings over guys that don't or organizations and ownership that don't. And this was one of those that absolutely wrecked. I see him trending now, too. Did he sign? Okay, no. I was about to say. <laughs> I got scared. I was like, did he just sign in the middle of the recording? Um, he's a Padre again. No. Um, but I think that this is an A-plus move because I think I'm petty. And I appreciate you being like, not only did I take your lunch money and stuff you in a locker, I also got you to pay for my dinner that night. That is what that trade was for. And I'm going to eat it in front of you. Yeah. And... <laughs> Who knows? Is Luis Pitino just a little bit of a failed prospect? Might be, unfortunately. I think a lot of that is health. If they turn this guy out into like some reliever, Brent Honeywell style, perhaps, that is just hilarious. And I think that just for the memes, this is an A-plus move because I just like the idea of Preller being like, you know, everyone keeps making fun of me. Let me pick up the guy that was the centerpiece of a trade that I got for a damn Cy Young winner. You know what I mean? Like, I just kind of, I'm fan fictioning it a little bit, but that's how I feel. I love it. Yeah. Blake Snell wins the Cy Young out the door. You get the guy back. That was pretty much the centerpiece of that for, for a waiver claim. And then Francisco Mejia was the other part of that. He's got a career 2.2 war. So, I mean, it's, yeah, that was one of the, if not the, one of the better, I mean, obviously the Tatis one is probably the best one. Not yeah. probably, it is the best one, Yeah, but this one is up there um, as the, one of the bigger fleece jobs. And so kudos. I am also a giant critic of Preller, but mm-hmm. this is a giant kudos. Absolutely. And, I just want to throw it out there. I still remember when this trade happened and people were, I think it was Jeff Passan sending like the, the what is Blake Hunt as the catching prospect. Like, look at this video that looked like it was shot on a potato. Here's my thing. I think prospects matter. I really do. They definitely matter. But you can't be sitting here looking at me like, oh, remember this Cy Young owner? But look at this dude hitting, you know, tee shots off of a flip phone like the sidekick by T-Mobile. You know what I mean? Like low call. Like, what if this guy? It's like, dude, what, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? I think Huntsman was like his third organization now anyway. So yeah. I think he's with the Mariners now, actually. It was so, just like, yeah. and this is no shots to Blake Hunt. Every now and then, the prospect overhype fetishization kicks in. And I think that happened a little bit with this Cole Wilcox being another one, um, part of this deal. And he was one that everyone was losing their mind about. Um, and obviously Patino. So look again, great stuff for Preller. Um, he's made some good moves for sure. And I think that I don't think this off season's over, man. I think that there's still a move to make. I don't know what it is. I think they might be waiting for the market to calm down a little bit, but my thing is, can you get a little bit of a decent DH if you still need bullpen, if there's still room, I don't know if they, there's any more move now, given all the moves they've made. I'm really big on Keenan Middleton. Um, I think that that is another bargain bin guy. And no, I don't think they're going to get Jordan Hicks. I think everyone knows who that guy is, and he's going to get a big contract. Um, so I'm really curious to see what they do. Nick, do you have any final thoughts on what I think we both agree has been, in context, so far, a solid offseason? Yes, um, it, a little bit a underwhelming, <laughs> an under, underwhelming off season. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly some some heady moves, like I mentioned, but um, clearly it is a start of a different direction for for an AJ Preller led Padres. And maybe he's maybe an off season where AJ Preller understands this could be it if it does not work out. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, maybe it, this it's been a clear shift in philosophy, and hopefully for the better, with more focused on player development with, with your own guys and, you know, some being, being smarter with your money, I think is, is a good thing. Not, I mean, there's definitely a difference between being cheap and being smart with your money. And I think hopefully um, we're going with the former being smarter with the potters are going smarter with their money. Absolutely. And again, I criticize teams. I don't believe in this whole be smart with your money thing, but I think that with the potters, they're the rare exception because the brewers, I'm like, no, they're just cheap guys. Stop. Stop talking about them. I don't want to hear it. Guardians, Kind of same thing. I know that they did the Jimenez thing, so maybe they're changing. Maybe Orioles. Oh well, look how good the guys. I have breaking news to you: the Orioles aren't going anywhere if they're still going to do this cheap thing. I'm, go ahead, go ahead. They're not going to do. It. I would literally rather be the Padres than the Orioles. I'm not kidding when I say that because I need organizational change. I need to see that they're ready to spend. Um, like that's, that team's spending what thirty million right now. <laughs> they could sign Shoto and Otani and have a less payroll than the Padres. Um, but like, I just. I'm just, I think that there's 
there's something about this team that needs to be less hired gun, go get the big fish, and that's it. You already have the big fish. You've got Tatis, Machado, and Bogarts. Whether they'll come through, I don't know. I'm optimistic they will, but I think that so far this offseason, solid moves, building around the edges, and I hope they continue to do that. I really do, and I think that they can. Um, Nick, do you have uh, any l- other things you'd like to plug now uh, for the good people? Well, I kind of already did my plug for East Village time, so I'll yeah. leave it at that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I I also did write an article today about um, that, where you know it yes. doesn't matter where yes. the Padre, like who the Padres free. go with, mm-hmm. if Bogarts, Tatis, and Machado don't come through, don't, and if they underachieve once again it will not matter who they bring in Mm -hmm. because then you become like those other teams I was mentioning where it's all these cool little moves, but you still need stars. And if their stars don't perform, then I don't know. Um, But again, man, Tatis, how are you going to put up a 4.4 F war? That's like your bad season. Like what's going on, man. I, I I can't wait. We love you, man. We love you. Um, Nick, this has been a blast. Um, Looking forward to seeing your work at East village times. Um, Not a BYU guy. Not a Seahawks guy, but I'll tune every now, now and then, especially well, with the Carroll stuff. It's okay. Yeah, and Padres guys too, for, absolutely. So everybody else, you've been listening to the Locked Up Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Follow myself on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres, or follow Nick on Twitter at Nick Lee 51 And until next time, stay safe, and of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.